Hey folks, it's Michael here with the CCERP podcast, Cypress Creek Ecological Restoration Project. Today, um, we've got an interesting guest, um, and we're going to talk about, um, you know, this would be good to learn what you can do to lower your water bill a little bit and not buy so much uh, fertilizer, what you can do to get more nutrition in you and your family's lives. Um, how you can help insects and birds in your area, how you can be more in tune with your environment and the local area. We'll be talking about things like that. Um, we'll be talking with the great Mark Merriweather, Porter Brooklyn. I've been to a number of his classes, I don't know, three or five or something like that. And the only reason it hasn't been more is because of like time and stuff. It's like I see him post... He's got a class coming up, and I'm going, crap, I'm busy. I can't go. Damn it. But, you know, because there's so much to learn from what he says in different places and different seasons and new plants all the time. Um, it's awesome, good stuff. So, Mark, could you introduce yourself, please? Hi. Okay, <laughs> thanks. It's, it's always hard to follow an introduction like that, but uh, <laughs> I, will, I will see what I can do. Yeah, so I am Dr. Mark Merriweather Vorderbergen. Um, by day, I am usually some form of formulation chemist. I have a master's in medicinal chemistry, a PhD in physical organic chemist, but PhD. like I tell people, we all make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> but on evenings and weekends, I am Merriweather. That was a name given to me a long time ago by my hiking buddies because I was always writing down and recording the plants we were finding Cool. because I am fascinated by the edible and medicinal plants that surround us. I devoted a pretty much my whole life to learning these it actually goes back to my parents, who were both children of the Great Depression. One of the ways the small farming communities got through that terrible time was through their knowledge of wild edible plants. So they played a big role in my childhood, and here I am today teaching it all over Texas, really. Yeah. What does your mom think? Oh, my mom is horribly... <laughs> She hates the fact that I teach these classes. She's horribly embarrassed. By it. <laughs> she doesn't want anyone to know the sort of food we had to eat growing up. That was uh, poor people's food. And it's like, well, <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> guess what, Mom? <laughs> yeah. But um, it might have been poor people food then, but it's probably like cutting edge nouveau cuisine nowadays. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's funny. But um, so you started out basically since you were like two years old or something? Yeah, my earliest memories were out collecting dandelion greens with mom or going out in the fall and climbing up the trees to get the nuts down for my dad and things like that. So cool. nice. It's always a big part of our, our life. I pretty much spent as much time as I could outdoors, and it's easier to find things to eat around you than going back home and you know, getting <laughs> food. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was nice back when we could run around for three or five or eight hours. You leave, Mom, I'll be home before dinner. And mm -hmm. yeah, in the earth out, learning, yep. playing, yeah. yeah, growing up, yeah. Pocket knife and into the woods for eight hours. <laughs> yeah. Or depending on where you were and all that, BB gun, twenty two, mm -hmm. <laughs> stuff like that. Getting some squirrel to bring home, rabbit, whatever. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Um so the first plant you remember getting is dandelion? The first one that I can remember identifying on my own, yeah, it was dandelion. Huh. That was a pretty common ubiquitous plant. It's everywhere, so. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, um, let's start, as uh, you usually do in your presentations, in your um, foraging classes and walks and all that. Um, how about, like, first of all, get straight. Um, what are some of the rules of foraging and what should people be aware of um in this we're doing this yeah that is really important especially here in the state of texas so i like to start by telling people there are four things as a forager you need to respect you need to respect the law you need to respect the land you need to respect the plant and you need to respect yourself let me just go over them quickly starting with respecting the law as much as people talk about public property in Texas, there's a whole bunch of organizations that are each responsible for little parts of that public property, hmm. and they all have very different rules on it. Hmm. It basically boils down that the two places you are absolutely guaranteed to be able to forage 
are along roadsides. Mm. Every spring, the Texas Department of Public Safety releases a paper saying, yes, you can pick the blue bonnets. You can pick any plant you mm. want along the side of Texas roads. You can't dig them up, but you can pick the area. Oh, okay. Hmm. okay. Then the other area is the uh, along what we call navigable streams, hmm. uh, which are in Texas streams that are considered you know, capable of supporting a boat, canoe, kayak, anything like that. Hmm. Uh, so from the water's edge up to the high water mark, that is considered open public land for anyone to take anything they want from there. Hmm. That being that. said, hmm. the homeowners that butt up against the streams will argue viciously with you against that and will very often call the cops on you if they see you digging step up from their property. Hmm. Okay, yeah, so it might be a good idea for people to have the law printed out in your pocket, hmm. ready to show the constable or sheriff. Yep, Because a nice laminated copy or you know, <laughs> yeah. Water, yeah. something like that, yes. Cool. Um, but otherwise, with permission, there are other places you can go, like uh, in the Big Thicket National Preserve. Uh, talk to the rangers there, and they will let you take uh, one pint of berries or nuts from the Big Thicket National Preserve uh, for your own personal use. Cool. If you're in the... Is that like one uh, pint a day or what? Just one well, pint? One per person per visit. I suppose if you keep going back, you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Helps if you live near there, I guess. Yeah. Uh, in the National Forest, so the Davy Crockett, the Angelina, and the Sam Houston National Forest, you can pick up to a gallon of mushrooms a day. Hmm. Generally, you are limited to private property. Mm -hmm. okay. So respect the law. You need then, permission. On some places, um, it, I know you said before that you can get a foraging permit. Like you have to, just like you have to get a hunting permit. Where are Correct. those places? Yeah, so, uh, in the National Forest, you can also okay. get what's called a land use permit. And one of the things that grants you, depending on which permit you get, is the ability to collect plants for non-commercial uses again. And then on the blue bonnet thing, it's along roads, but you can't go into a field to get the blue bonnets? Okay. Nope. The, uh, the, they actually state the roadside area is from the edge of the shoulder down through the bottom of the ditch and up to the high point on the opposite side of the ditch. Mm -hmm. Or the fence line, the property fence line. So okay. that area okay. between Thanks. the fence line and the and the road is fair game. Okay. So mm -hmm. uh, next one, respect the land. That is to simply leave no trace. There should be no sign you are there. No leaving your water bottles. No littering anything. Please, like that. yeah. I pick up too much of that stuff. <laughs> it's yeah. The Texas Parks and Wildlife just on their Facebook today had a post about all the crap people are leaving behind in the parks, and it's like, why people? Yeah. Anyway, uh, third, respect the plant. And by this, I mean we want to harvest in a sustainable manner. Uh, my website, www.foragingtexas.com, it has over 200 plants on there. Each one has all sorts of multiple pictures and how to use it, when to use it, how to find it, all the stuff you need, toxic mimics. And really but quickly, one of the key and folks, yeah. I'll put a link in the show notes to the website and to his book on Amazon and his like store with his other books. So, sorry, go ahead. Oh, and I was just going to say, one of the key bits of information each plant has is its abundance code. Is the plant invasive? Is it plentiful? Is it common, uncommon, rare, or endangered? Because that tells you how much of the plant you can take. And that's really important because you don't want to take so much that you harm the plant's ability. And if you go up in some places, there are wild plants like ramps that are being wiped out from the, from the wild because they're so popular and everyone's taking them. Mm-hmm. Then the final is respect yourself, and that just means don't eat anything poisonous. So yeah. <laughs> it kind of goes without saying, but you want to make sure you've properly identified the plant or mushroom before eating it, making sure it matches five to ten different structural features you know, between the plant you're looking at and your reference guide. I've learned a lot of people don't know how to look at a plant. They don't know what are the key features that they need to identify. Mm-hmm. So there's that, but there's also you don't want to eat an edible plant from a toxic environment. Mm. So like around old buildings where they could have been painted with lead-based paint, uh, that lead will have collected in the soil around the building, so you want to back up a good 25 or 30 feet away. Um, pesticides. If a yard or area has been treated with fire ant killer, grub killer, or things like that, 
uh, however long the active life of that fire ant killer or pesticide is, to be safe, you really need to double the time. So if it's a andro once a year, you got to wait two years before you can forage there. Hmm. So okay. whatever is in the soil can very likely be in the plants. So you want to make sure you're not eating anything poisonous. And then folks can do different things like on the roadside. It is for me because of car exhaust, maybe some um, metal dust from brakes. Um, I avoid that. I try to stay at least like 100 yards or so away from any roadway. Yeah, and really the the what I recommend from roadways is first find really you know low use roads. Mm-hmm. So there isn't a lot of that stuff. Yeah. In particular dirt roads cuz dirt roads are good at absorbing the stuff and keeping mm-hmm. it there on the road rather than often. Mm-hmm. Plus if it's a dirt road it's probably not used very much. Mhm. Yeah, interesting. But then what I also recommend is especially getting seeds from the roadsides, not the whole plant, but just taking the seeds of the of the key plants and then planting them elsewhere in your own property or something like cool. that. Yeah, and um, folks should really be careful about getting something they don't know. Look into it. Make sure you know more, know more of the plant. What else can be like it to make sure you're getting the right thing. Um, don't pick anything on your own until you're knowledgeable, or uh, wait till you got like someone who knows their stuff around you. I know. Yeah, like when I was just starting out. I wanted to make some uh, tea from not just Yupon Holly, but American Holly. And, yeah, I was, like, kind of, you know, just starting. And I had – it was hard on my brain and mind to get used to all these shapes and colors because I had, like, zero experience in that. I wasn't a painter, wasn't a sculptor, didn't didn't do home decorating. I'm all, like, math and stuff. And so, oh, here's this, this, like, green leaf that's kind of, like, prickly and stuff and kind of waxy. So I'm going to use it to make some tea. And then I find out after I had the tea, like a week later, I had used, um, what is it? Uh, cherry Chinese laurel. Per- cherry Ooh. laurel. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I shouldn't laugh, but, but hey, you survived. <laughs> and so. then, yeah, I'm like, like looking it up and like, I spent like an hour or two, like researching it. And um, damn, what is in the cherry laurel again? What is that? Um, cyanide. Yeah, it's got cyanide in it, right? <laughs> I'm like, whoa. Um, <laughs> so I read Wikipedia and all this stuff. So I have to ask, how did it taste? <laughs> uh, wasn't good, you know, wasn't bad. Wendy, yeah. Cherry. <laughs> I'm curious now. I, I drank it. It's not like I made some with, uh, um, what is it? Mm-mm-mm. Magnolia. Because okay. Magnolia... Um, yeah. is in some cultures they think it's uh anti-cancer mm-hmm. and so i had there's some... actually some uh research that supports that especially oh, with good. the seeds oh cool yeah. and um i had some magnolia it was nothing but magnolia and man that was bitter ah! <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what then you I... need <laughs> is uh it's backwards but magnolia ah! magnolia flowers in vodka <laughs> nice yeah that's <laughs> interesting huh cocktail mixture but so that was bitter, but the stuff with cherry laurel, you know, it's just like a green tea. Um, I didn't, since it was kind of new flavor, I didn't know the difference. And um, yeah, more green. I wouldn't recommend it to folks. Okay, folks, do not do that. Make sure you know what cherry laurel looks like and avoid it. It's got cyanide nice. in it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so. Like, if I could just enter it. A lot of people say there's no such thing as a stupid question. <laughs> but there is, and I get it constantly. It's I <laughs> ate this. What is it? Day oh, yeah. after day after day. <laughs> it's like yeah. it looked pretty. I thought I'd try and eat it. <laughs> you know, then I felt weird. Or, <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> birds eat it, so I thought I could eat yeah. it too. Okay, that's a myth too. Just because birds and squirrels or deer can eat it doesn't mean we can. Mm-hmm. I, I've heard that even in like some books. Like I think it. In some book, um, I don't know, some like military guy or Navy Zeal or something where they should know better. They're talking about someone um, in a fiction book, like seeing a squirrel eating it and then trying it. Maybe it was in a movie, but it was like yeah. ludicrous. Folks, you, you know, it's like clearly you don't know anything about <laughs> I would say foraging. the one wild animal that you can probably use as a guide is the wild pig. Hmm. 
Mm. They actually have a yeah. very, very similar biochemistry and digestive system to humans, yeah, an immune which system. probably explains a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's why but, um, <laughs> folks a long time ago had to um, had prescriptions against eating pork because diseases that can affect pork could affect mm -hmm. us. Yeah, exactly. They didn't yep. know that, but they just knew that we'd get sick when we had pork. But then you learn you got to cook it right and all this. But yeah, it's interesting. But yeah, the, a lot you, of the yeah anti all the like you said the infections and diseases, you know, swine flu. I mean, it's hmm. a carrier oh, yeah. for yeah. And then um, an example for folks like uh, some deer and birds. Yeah, deer and birds can eat uh, poison ivy like berries and stuff. Yep. But um, I wouldn't recommend putting in your salad. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've had that question. <laughs> wow. Or um, I've even seen a deer driving home one day from a local park. This was awesome. I wish I could have taken a video, but I was driving, you know, going like 40 or 50 cars passing on a two-lane road. Um, it was up on its hind legs eating Yupon Holly. Oh, wow. That was fascinating. Yeah. I just imagine a highly caffeinated deer running. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I feel great. This is awesome. <laughs> let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Come on, guys. Yep. Yep. Yopon Holly for the, the listeners. It's the only naturally occurring source of caffeine that grows here in North America, and it's a really delicious tea from the leaves. The berries will give you an upset stomach, but the leaves make a great tea. Yeah. And um, so I don't know. You know, since I was driving by, I'm not sure if the deer was eating the berries too, but. I don't probably think, would. Yeah, because I don't think it, can uh, really, it doesn't have a fork, and it can't really be too selective. It just got a bite. So. Yeah, well, and the berries are actually loaded with calories, hmm. and that's one of the reasons the birds like them. It's a great source of calories for the birds, especially the ones that are about to fly across the Gulf of Mexico. You huh. know, their, oh, wow. Their fall you know, migration. But humans, we can't handle them. Yeah. What happens when we eat them? We get sick. Yeah. We get a sick <laughs> stomach. It's, you know, it's kind of yeah i don't feel good sort of thing it's not like deadly or anything it's, mm -hmm. think of it like a mild hangover sort of hmm. yeah no thanks i'd rather not think about that hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but so uh did we go over all the rules of foraging got everything yep, covered yep. we covered cool. all those cool um so where do you want to go next like uh into some plants around here or what people can do in oh. their yards or we can do that. Uh, there's multiple paths. I was going to say one thing with the seeds, if you've collected from the roadsides, mm -hmm. you can, over time, depending on how much effort you put into it, build what's called a permaculture food forest mm -hmm. in your backyard. And yeah. So where, I mean, if you look around, no one, you know, the only gardener really would be God for the, you know, the wild plants. And they seem to be doing fine on their own. Yeah. And as opposed to most landscaping, takes a lot of care and effort because a lot of the landscaping plants are non-native. They're not really designed for this area. A few do okay in this area. But uh, the wild plants have, you know, they got millennia, tens of thousands of years of adapting to an area. And they're usually really good at it. Whereas mm -hmm. you know, more domesticated plants one of the things they traded off to be useful to us is their ability to survive in the wild. Mm -hmm. So where I'm going with this, I said, if you fill your backyard on purpose with wild edible plants from around the, you know, your area, you end up with a really good self-sustaining ecosystem that requires very little work and produces a lot of food. Yeah. And it's used to the amount of precipitation we get in the area. So you don't got to water it extra. Yep. And that's one thing I've noticed out in the woods sometimes, sometimes like some, it might be dry. People are having to water their yard, their yard, and then I go and find this nice little green spot <laughs> you know, in the woods. Well, yeah. It's doing just fine. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, it's protected. I mean, the, the wind isn't drying it out. The sunlight isn't drying it out. The, and there are a number of trees that do, you know, fine in full sun, and they then protect the lower things. That's why the the whole permaculture idea it mm. starts with the trees and has a whole eight layers of stuff all the way down to underground tubers. Yeah, so and, ground covers and yeah. for folks, would you tell them what is permaculture? What do you mean by that idea? So the it, it's kind of okay. It's going to be sound like a kind of a '70s hippie thing because it kind of was, but with the scientific background, uh, permanent agriculture is the idea, and just creating a self-sustaining ecosystem using the principles that the wild uses uh, to 
bring together plants that wouldn't normally be together because with the permaculture, they would use traditional domesticated food plants. Um, but plant them, if you're familiar with companion planting, this is companion planting on an ecosystem type scale, like I said, from the underground tubers, the ground cover, uh, herbs, bushes, vines, trees, the, the whole works. And like um, some, really quickly, like some, some people, a lot of people know about some companion plants, like what we all learn about, um, what is it? In farming, some people learning to use what, like clover and corn, or something like that. Yeah. What is it in different yeah. rotation? Um, yeah, or even what they call the three sisters planting, yeah. where they have the the corn, the beans, and the squash. Yeah, where the squash vines kind of cover the soil and keep it shaded and moist, and then the beans climb up on the corn, and the corn grows tall, and everything works together. But in the case of permaculture. It's not just three plants. In my case, in my backyard, it, well, last time I surveyed it was 2014. And over the course of the year, there were 81 different edible, drinkable, or medicinal plants back there wow. in a 30-foot wow. by 70-foot square, well, rectangular uh, suburban backyard. Wow, nice. And then if folks want more information, like we discussed this a little bit in uh, episode two, talking to Jim Fordyce, uh, professor of ecology at the University of Tennessee. Um, but yeah, like as a lot of people are starting to learn, um, with the companion plant stuff, um, fungus is very important for mm -hmm. trees and plants, for example. And that's, that's one indication of having a healthy yard. If you got a lot of mushrooms, yep. it's not something to kill. We shouldn't put down fungicides. Oh my gosh, Oof. there's mushrooms. It's like <laughs> a misconception. It's uh, yeah. very healthy. It's good for the plants. But so what are some of the things you have in your uh, little permaculture? All right. Room? So like right now, one of the things that's blooming is the goldenrod. Hmm. That's the stuff you see all over, kind of tall, scraggly plant with a pyramid of gold yellow flowers on the top. Um, it grows all summer long, doesn't need any supplemental water. During the summer, the leaves make a really good seasoning added into foods, kind of the flavor is going to be different from person to person hmm. because it really depends on what are the key taste receptors on your own personal tongue that you focus in on. Hmm. Um, and with things with wild foods, there isn't a cultural agreement on what the flavor is, you know, hmm. like potato chips. Every, there's four molecules that make up the flavor of potato chips. Hmm. Each person tastes mainly one and then the other three to lesser amounts. But we all agree you know, that those four are present. It's a potato chip. Hmm. Well, like with goldenrod, to me, the leaves have almost uh, kind of a, an anise or black licorice sort of flavor with uh, hints of ginger. Hmm. And so I like to use it in different stir fries and Asian cooking. Can you put it in bef before, like while you're cooking or you wait till after? Uh, before or during. Okay. Yeah, the leaves are, are somewhat a little on the tough side. So actually adding them, adding them in as part of the cooking process is great. Okay. So just... Drop them up, dice them up. You know, add them when you add the onions is usually hmm. okay. <laughs> the going theory. Okay. Um, they also have really good medicinal properties. Uh, I dry the leaves also, and I add them to my coffee every morning. Huh. They have a, a tissue toughening uh, property, especially for like uh, blood vessels and lymph and things like that. So, but it's not going to make girls all buff. They can take it too. No, no, it's no, okay, no, right? no, no, yeah. no, no, no. They're it, still feminine. To, right. The main. The main example of what the goldenrod is good for medicinally is varicose veins, hmm. where the blood is seeping out and, and you know and pooling around like the ankles and the legs and so forth. But the goldenrod, the leaves and the flowers have been shown to tighten up, or well, not so much tighten up, but but you know kind of re knit those tissues, hmm. and so you know the fluid seeps out at the proper rate rather than just kind of oozing out and forming these big black worms under the skin. Hmm. Um, so it's, it's useful for that sort of thing. This time of year right now, there's all sorts of flowers out there, uh, which are good. Uh, they make a great tea. They have that same sort of medicinal property. They also help with uh, stuffing of head cold type stuff, but they have a wonderful flavor. Hmm. They are the last flower of the year, usually, that the bees are going after honey. Um, but what's really great about goldenrod is in this, like, spring or summer, if you prune it, uh, normally it will just put up one stalk. But if you prune it, it could put out four new growths. So it will quadruple the number of flowers hmm. it's going hmm. to form in the fall. 
cool. then I'll take two of those flower clusters and leave two for the bees, and they still come out ahead of, of the deal. Cool, nice. Then I use those in teas and tinctures. and Yeah, so that's a way, um, it shows right there, a way you could help with the insects and everything, mm -hmm. um, you know, have yeah, golden... the pollination and feeding the bees. It's something yeah. we need to do right now. And then if it's okay with your um, community rules, have a beehive, then you can have some honey, or else change the dang rules. It's like, because <laughs> a lot of them are just, stupid and non-ecological and mm -hmm. um, kind of anti taking care of yourself and gardening and all kinds of important things we need to do. Yeah. But, um, so change those, but so you got goldenrod, what else? So another one that I have growing thick in my yard right now, um, is called betony, B E T O N Y betony. It is a wild mint doesn't have a strong mint flavor, but it has a lot of health benefits. It's very high in vitamins and minerals, but it's also a very good uh, medicinal herb for colds and head congestion. There's an old saying, if you have a cold, sell your coat and buy betony. <laughs> so oh. the, it was uh, you know, dried, made into a tea, a tincture, or uh, even smoked. Uh, cleavers are out there. Most people hate cleavers. They're it's that sticky weed, Velcro weed type stuff, absolutely loaded with vitamin C and makes a wonderful emerald green tea. Hmm. Cool. Um, I'm walking through. The wild onions are starting to pop up again, so yeah. lots yeah. and lots of chives and I've seen bulbs. that recently. I've yeah. seen some Bitter big, press. big patches. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. You can smell it. Like if someone mows a patch of onion, it's like, yeah, mm, onion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a bittercress, which is in the mustard family. It has a wonderful horseradish sort of flavor. And then, of course, wood sorrel, oxalis species, that mm, has a yeah. wonderful tangy lemon sort of flavor. And since we're entering soup season uh, with the cold weather, I think it got down to like 76 degrees. Out there. <laughs> uh, yeah, Everybody's so, hey, out there in their heavy weather. coats. Yeah. yeah, so you add wood sorrel to the cream soups, like cream of mushroom, cream of potato, even mm. cream of celery, mm. and it adds a nice tangy zing to the soup that's really, really, really good. While it's cooking or at the end? or uh, With the soup, add it uh, during the cooking process. If you're going to use that tangy, lemony sort of flavor for fish or chicken or something like that, uh, then you would add it at the end, sprinkle it on. Uh, kind of like squeezing lemon juice on on you know food. You just mm -hmm. sprinkle the oxalis species on it. Yeah, and that stuff's good. I like uh, when you pull it up by the whole stem, mm -hmm. not just the leaf. Um, the stem's mm -hmm. got this nice juicy squirt to it. Yep. Yeah. It and the me, seed pods and yeah. the whole plant. Yeah. yeah. Remember the candy we had when we were little? Is like um, juicy squirts or something? Uh, it was like, uh, uh, juicy fruit? No. No, it's like yeah, it's like gum maybe in a like gushers prism it wasn't maybe was it not the one i had anyway maybe there was a gushers but um it had I like remember. juice in the middle when you bite bit it it squirted out oh. um some flavor i'm old enough to remember the little wax bottles filled with yeah. sugar water. i remember those yeah yep but yeah eating wax that's a fun thing to do when you're a kid <laughs> yeah yeah but, unless uh, you had braces oh yeah well yeah. <laughs> um uh, yeah. Wild violets are, are plentiful right now, too. Those are loaded with vitamin A, vitamin C. You can eat them raw, but they also have a nice uh, thickening power, so you can mix huh. them with your soup or you know to make a stew you know, or a curry sauce or anything where you want to thicken up the sauce. And this is a nice pl way, too. It reminds me, like I said at the beginning, if you want to save money, I was thinking water and fertilizer, but I um, mean, you get some of this, you don't got to buy those uh, yeah. vitamins. And then a lot of the vitamins people buy, they want to get less expensive stuff. They're less uh, bioavailable. They're not as effective. A lot of times you're just like, it goes in your mouth and goes out the other end and you don't really get any vitamins out of it. Yeah. I said, uh, basically, vitamins just result in really expensive pee. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> I'll go there, folks. <laughs> you know, it's... Yeah. So yeah, like you said, the whole bioavailability, uh, you know, getting it straight from the plant sources has been shown to be the best way. It takes yeah. a little longer to be absorbed. It takes longer to pass through the intestines, so it can be absorbed. It doesn't just go straight into the you know blood, into the kidneys, and out. Yeah, and sometimes um, some of the things people sell 
um, when they're tested, there's not even in it what people claim. Um, you know, some companies, of course, are legit and honest, but some are um, not. Yeah. So especially in the herbal market and depending yeah. on what you get. It, so, yeah. yeah. And then also with the the whole wild edibles, you're outside, you're bending, you're twisting, you're pulling, you know, you're doing all that stuff. You're not just pushing a shopping cart down through, you know, a grocery store. Yeah. There's a whole other aspect to the. It's you like. You probably heard the saying, uh, let food be thy medicine. And medicine be thy food. Let gathering food be thy medicine. True. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like some people call it this lady, Katie Bowman, um, and some other people they call some little exercise sessions during the day, like movement snacks. Oh, and she talks about vitamin uh, movement and stuff like that. Well, they say sitting in a chair is the new smoking. I yeah. Mean, if if yeah. you're stuck in an office all day and you're not doing much, you're, yeah, that's not how we were designed. We should true. Mm -hmm. They need to release wolves in the building. So we're <laughs> yeah. you know, run high and climb up something. True. And they don't really go after us as much as some people think. I think a lot of, Top we'll make predators. Them yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Make sure they go after us. Modify wolves to attack your moon. So yeah. What could GMO go wrong? wolves, right. <laughs> but, we have movement. Do we? Yeah, they can make GMO wolves that attack and are vicious but have no teeth or claws. Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they just have really bad breath or slimy, you know. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're going to come and lick you and leave a layer of slime on you. There we go. <laughs> yeah. But um, <laughs> that's another way to save money. It's like, um, you don't got to spend so much money at a yoga place or whatever. You know, still do some of that, of course. But if you're in the sunshine, it's much better for you than being indoors. And mm -hmm. you get to do all these movements for free. And heck, it's like start getting together with friends. and Or if you have a yoga class or whatever, heck, everyone come together to one garden. Do it at your place. Go to another the next day. Um, you're outside. You got the social aspect, which is really important for us. But then you're saving money. Um, you're outdoors, much better overall, all around. Another great thing is just talk to your neighbors and make a deal with them that you will take care of the weeds in their yard <laughs> yeah. if they don't put any pesticides down. Nice. Uh, you do that, and you can easily, you know, replace 10% of your store-bought food hmm. with stuff harvested around your neighborhood. And yeah. like you said, it also helps strengthen the bonds in the neighborhood, which is really important and something modern mm -hmm. society lacks. Yeah. You know, a lot of people yeah. never really talk to their neighbors. Yeah. Then you have a better idea who should be there, who shouldn't. Um, better idea of recognizing danger, communicating with each other, keep it safe. Well, yeah. one of the other side benefits is you know who has the tool you need to finish a job. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I'm kind of the go-to <laughs> in the neighborhood. If someone needs a tool, like, you know, that special wrench for attaching a sink, I'll get it. Hey, Mark, who has one of those? Oh, oh, Eric has one. <laughs> yeah. Take you over there. That's you funny. Know. Yeah. Yeah, we need more of that. The repository of, of neighborhood knowledge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The uh, troop leader of the Boy Scouts or whatever. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Um, and so, what else you got back there? You got, we were on what's okay. oral, I think. Uh, this wondering. So, yeah. because the oak on holly, oh, the oak trees right now, the acorns. Uh, acorns are fascinating. They're between 70 and 80% starch, which makes them on par with grain like barley and wheat. Hmm. The problem is they're loaded with tannic acid, which is bitter. So you have to run a whole lot of water through them to leach that out, kind of like you're making coffee. But once that's done, you have a gluten-free flour, which you can grind up and make, you know, uh, like gravies out of, thicken things out. But more importantly, people have started, you know, they rediscovered that, hey, with that much starch and a little bit of maltose, and, you know, we can make beer out of it. Huh. Wow. Huh. So it's, it's on par with, with grain. And in fact, mm. oh, yeah, that wow. goes back uh, because it's Thanksgiving, the, the whole the early Plymouth colony, the whole Plymouth Rock and the first Thanksgiving and all that, they ran out of grain. They, they had seed grain that they didn't want to touch, but they didn't have a way of making beer. And if you mm. think about that, then most of the water supplies were not good. So to avoid getting what we call beaver fever or other you know, aquatic pestis, uh, uh, microbial infections, they would drink beer instead of water. Hmm. But without the grains, they couldn't make 
the beer until someone said, well, there's all these acorns around. Let's just see what happens. And it made a very good beer. And they were like, hmm. whoa, the colony is saved. Well, huh, interesting. <laughs> now we have acorn beer to drink. A new aspect of history I didn't know. <laughs> I work cool. with a number of breweries and distilleries and so forth on I'll unique bet. beers. Huh. So cool. Things I'm trying to work with one is, is get them to make an acorn beer. They're still a little iffy about it. It's a little more work. Hmm. Um, there's one extra step, the leaching thing that you have to do. That's yeah, that. what I'd like to do sometime is uh, get some of the acorns, process them, and um, kind of chop them up and use it as a breading for fish. That seems like it would be good. Yeah. Fish or chicken, some fried mm -hmm. fish, fried chicken. That sounds like it sounds like it'd be really good. Snapper. Oh, yeah. I'm just thinking like some some fried mushrooms with a acorn batter. Hmm. That'd be good. Nice. Yeah. Or with the with the snapper, acorn and pecan, maybe maybe they go good together. That would be good. Yeah. Now I'm getting yeah, no. hungry. Okay, podcast is over. I gotta go eat. <laughs> <laughs> to the backyard. <laughs> but um, when making beer, do they heat up the water? Yeah. Is, okay. So that yeah. would get rid of the That's microbial the stuff. stuff. Yeah. Okay. So with the acorns, you actually have to let them sprout first. And what that does, it releases the enzyme that converts the starch, starts breaking it down into the different sugars that the yeast can then attack. Mm. Okay. But uh, so it's partly the boiling and part, well, I guess only the boiling would be needed to take care of all the microbial stuff that would cause the beaver fever and all that. Um, yeah. Okay. I was wondering about the fermentation and all that, but cool. So, um, yeah. And then... Um, with the oaks, you got the acorns, but, um, we also got the galls, right? Right. Correct. The oak galls. If you've ever looked up at an oak tree and you've seen these weird round fruit, uh, that's actually the result of what's called the oak gall wasp laying its egg under the, the, the bark of the oak tree, along with a chemical that alters the DNA of the tree in that area, which causes the tree then to grow this wooden ball around the oak gall wasp's egg. The tree hates us. It does not want its DNA messed with, so it starts pumping all sorts of chemicals into that oak gall to try and kill the larva, kill the egg. Uh, sometimes it's successful, sometimes it isn't, but the end result is those little round wooden balls up in the trees are loaded with medicinal properties, uh, in particular antifungal and antibacterial. Cool. So the oak galls can be crushed up and brewed like a tea or coffee. And then you can either drink it for if you have food poisoning or the beaver fever we talked about earlier or something like that, some sort of internal bacterial infection. It will help fight that. It was also used to wash out wounds that hmm. you know, to help prevent infections or attack infections that are starting to grow. Um, so those two things have been known for millennia even before we knew what an infection was just mm. that you know the oak gall seems to to fight it cool. what's really cool is more recently some fascinating research has been done showing that the one of the components in the the oak gall a chemical called gallic acid or gallic acid which uh you know chemists apparently don't have a lot of creativity when it comes to naming something but uh <laughs> it's shown to disrupt and break apart the protein fibroid clusters that form in the brains of uh, people with Parkinson's disease. Mm, wow. And mm. so they've shown there's been some really neat preliminary results that it slows down the development of the, the Parkinson's disease and may even help re, uh, reverse it some. So there's a lot of studies going on in that right now. Cool. Shows you to, the importance of eating natural. Mm. Um, it's, not, it's not a little academic airy fairy thing but pretty serious stuff just like mm -hmm. um dr terry walls w-a-h-l-s she had ms she was in stage two stage mm -hmm. one is where you get a little worse get better i mean level off get a little worse maybe get a little better and then stage two is just psh, you're going down right. she was an m is an md knew had all the best medical care in the world it wasn't helping then she got into the the paleo thing but she was doing supplements and that helped but she didn't really cure the disease or put it into remission or whatever until she went all natural diet, getting all her nutrients from, mm -hmm. um, you know, whole foods, plants, animal stuff, and exercising. 
And now she's like, she used to be in like a zero gravity chair. Now she's like, rides her bicycles. She can go on her rounds just fine. Um, she can walk around. She lectures. She's written books. Just um, amazing stuff. And um, same thing yeah. here with like the oat galls. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and uh, Dr. Nicole Apleon from the History Channels alone, she had the same thing. She had huh. MS. Wow. Yeah. Uh, she was in a wheelchair. She started doing the different herbal foraging, herbal medicine sort of was able to get out of the chair and ended up actually you know, being strong enough to go out in the woods by herself for 30 yeah. some days. Yeah. All that so. crazy loony. <laughs> yeah, well, there's something <laughs> I said about stuff. evolution. and you know. Yeah, that's one thing people don't consider enough, the biology of it. Look, look at it too much as chemistry. All they care about is the calories, unfortunately, because of what's talked about. But we need more than just calories. We're a lot more complicated than that. Yep. Yeah. But uh, cool. Um, and so, if I remember right, from a few like three or five or seven years ago or whatever, when I asked you it one thing, was it like a small handful of galls in a gallon of water simmered for half an hour at yeah. least? So about well, a, I yeah, half a cup. Actually, I would say for most people, half a cup of crushed up oak galls in a quart of water. A quart. Okay. So, yeah, and that will that will be a good concentration. Okay. But it's one of those things, part of it, one of the things with wild plants is they can be very inconsistent in the concentrations of compounds. So mm -hmm. you, know, you play around some, see if it works. If it doesn't, try a little more. There's some yeah. trial and error involved. Hmm. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, from half a, you know, well, I guess a quarter cup in a, in a quart would be uh, a, a full cup in a gallon, you could go up to two cups in a gallon hmm. and not have any problem. It's going to taste pretty bitter. So you might want to mix honey or hmm. something like that, or you know, something maybe on the sour side too with it to help balance out the bitter. But hmm. Okay, cool. Um, and that's on your website, right? Yeah. Is that part? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, the medicinal properties of the plants and so forth. Too. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so what else do you got in your little garden? Well, I'm thinking, I'm just walking through. Of course, uh, you know, the, the dewberries and blackberries, yeah. using the leaves to make tea. Good uh, stuff. Passion vine. Yeah. The Passiflora incarnata. It's a, it's a native vine. Um, the fruit make the best margaritas you've ever had. Huh. <laughs> but the, uh, the leaves are very potent sedative, and the flowers are really fascinating from a medicinal point of view because they're a anti-anxiety Hmm. Uh, properties. I don't have a problem with anxiety, but apparently a lot of people do. And what's interesting about the flowers of the Passiflora incarnata, they are filled with a chemical called GABA, G-A-B-A, -A, gamma aminobutyric acid. Uh, GABA in the brain triggers the brain to release serotonin, which is then you know, the feel-good brain drug. The problem is if you consume GABA in a pill form or something like that, it can't cross what's called the blood-brain barrier. It's a special membrane that keeps a lot of stuff out that could get elsewhere in the body, but it's a protective measure of the brain. So just consuming GABA does nothing for releasing serotonin in your brain. But they've shown with these flowers, if you take those, the GABA concentration and the serotonin concentration in your brain increases. Hmm. Wow, interesting. Good. Hmm. So they think there's some other compound or molecule in there that is like the, the key master. It opens up that blood-brain barrier so the GABA can get through hmm. and do its job. So there's a lot of work being done on that. Because one of the issues with a lot of medications that we'd like to use for treating brain type problems is they can't get through that blood brain barrier. So if there's a molecule you can use to unlock it for a bit, then it opens up all sorts of new medical uses. Hmm. Yeah. Cool. Kind of Interesting. Yeah. And then that's um, a plant people should get if they don't know about, I mean, they want beautiful stuff in the yard. You don't need to get all these things from elsewhere. It's like, we got wild violet. The passiflora mm -hmm. is just gorgeous. It looks like it's something that should grow in Costa Rica, not here. Yeah. It's a big tropical looking vine. Yeah. It's like, beautiful flower and um it's great for the butterflies yeah yeah the especially the uh gulf fritillary yep um yep. and then we got the prairie nymph around here that are native they're just beautiful flowers yep. um i don't remember there's like i think maybe another one i've seen that's like i think it's 
three, not just two, that I think are like should be in Costa Rica, not here. But uh, <laughs> well, probably the bee balm and the wild bergamot and some I of those. Seen those beautiful, yeah, have really strong, wonderful odors that make a really good tea and have medicinal properties. And oh whole. yeah, and then some um, wild onion and wild garlic flowers are beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, even society garlic, you can cheat if you really do want to mess it. You can use the. Hmm. The yeah. leaves and flowers and tubers of the society garlic as an onion. Hmm. It's in the yeah. same family. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, Turk's like, cap oh, is yeah. another really good food. That's a, a native mallow, so it's related to the hibiscus. Its flowers hmm. are small, only about the size of a thumb, but very beautiful, very plentiful. They start showing up in June, and they go until a really hard frost kills the plant. But the flowers are edible. The little calyx underneath the flower are edible. The young leaves are edible. The fruit of it that it forms is edible. So I, I've it. eaten some of that. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good plant. Yeah. And then, um, what is it? The do, 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 Barbados cherry? Yep. Barbados cherry. Yep. Uh, the, it makes clusters of berries three times a year. So it's a very prolific plant. Hmm. The berries are fairly small. I mean, they, you know, a little bit bigger than your average pea, but one berry contains enough vitamin C for an adult for a day. Well, wow. are they native or not? They are actually native hmm. um, up to southern Texas, you know, like the Brownsville area, hmm. the, the, the valley down there. But they do well. You can get um, almost to Austin. Uh, hmm. Cold weather, like if it gets down below 20 degrees Fahrenheit, the above ground portion will die off, but the roots will usually survive and then it comes back. But around here, are they, they're not native? No, not okay. native here, but they are used in landscaping here. Yeah, so. yeah, I've seen them on some parks. Um, cool. But yeah, but then like those... southern wax myrtle is native. And that's uh, the secret ingredient in a lot of Cajun food. It's a hmm. kind of a multi trunk, small tree, really, really big bush. Uh, the crushed up leaves, I, I say they describe them as Cajun oregano. Hmm. And you just use it as a replacement for Italian seasonings to make like a Cajun lasagna. Hmm. Good stuff. But, um, yeah, and uh, the speaking of the like dewberry from earlier, I mean, people go out and pick the berries, but I think, as he said with the leaves, I like to use the dewberry and the Yupon holly together to make a tea. <laughs> It's like a good mix, like you've mentioned yep. before in your classes. Yep. Another one I'm finding is uh, muscadine grape leaves, dried muscadine, muscadine grape leaves mixed with the Yopon holly. It makes a really good flavor. Oh, wow. I'll have to try that. Thanks. Huh. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, that's one. People might not know. We actually have, like, wild grapes around here that we can eat. <laughs> a lot, yeah. <laughs> so what are some so, of those? So the two main ones are the muscadine, which is a wonderful, sweet, raw-eating grape. You'll find that more in wooded areas, um, climbing up amongst the trees, especially along like Cypress Creek and Spring Creek. And then in the more sunny, open field areas will be mustang grape. Uh, the mustang grape is very, very, very acidic. You don't normally eat it raw. Usually if you do eat it raw, you end up with chemical burns on your lips and tongue. Hmm. The way to tell them apart, uh, besides where they grow, like I said, usually it'll be mustang in the sun and muscadine in the shade, but looking at the undersides of the leaves. On the muscadine, the sweet, raw, edible one, uh, the leaf is shiny and green top and bottom. Smooth, shiny, hmm. green. On the mustang, the top is going to be smooth and green, but if you flip it over, the underside is going to be gray and fuzzy like the nose of a horse. Mm -hmm. So you think the, the, the nose of the horse, that is the Mustang grape, that is the one that you do not eat raw, but it actually makes a better jelly, jam, or wine than the muscadine hmm. because the, those acids also give a really complex and rich flavor once you've boiled it and sugared it and fermented and all that. It's actually very, very, very good. And for some folks, like, you can eat the Mustang, though. I've done that before. I've eaten a number of them out in the wild. Yeah, uh, if, you, if you avoid yeah. the skin, if you suck, you know, just yeah. the, the, the pulpy flesh from the inside out, they're pretty good. Yeah. It's the skin that really is loaded with the acid. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, um, 
you can identify them a little bit better too and differentiating them from, from other things we also got like frost grape out here and gray bark so mm. at least four species do you know of yeah. any others in our area uh not off the top the the frost grape that's the the or the fall grape that produces little tiny clusters those are very sour tart too yeah. but they're pretty good in uh, jam or jam, uh, jam or jelly or wine and mm -hmm. it's just getting enough of them uh, it's a little difficult there's like eight or nine wild grapes in the area but hmm. there's really only those three or four that are really you know prolific yeah hmm. okay and then um i think i've only found those four so far maybe another one but i've also seen back to the passiflora um in my ventures around cypress creek in and in and around the woods and along the creek i've actually found also the yellow passion flower i found the yep. vine but i have yet to find a flower i haven't had a yellow flower yet that i've seen they're very small they're like the size of a dime oh hmm. yeah okay. so you're talking kind of the small it has the almost more of a rounded leaf rather than the deeply lobed yeah and little tiny black fruit yeah, I forget the exact shape, but yeah, um, yeah. I know I found the vines like in a that. number of places, but sometimes they'll call them the dwarf passion vine. Okay. But yeah, the fruit or the the flowers on that one are very small. Okay. Is it? I think it might be Passiflora lutea, something like that. L -U -T -E -A? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, that's cool. the dwarf one. Okay. Hmm. It's good to know the flowers are small. I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh thought... yeah, small, small. Yeah. Like, like <laughs> okay. <time. laughs> okay. Cool. 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 But. Uh, so, um, I think, was there something else I was going to, like, bring up in regard to that or what you were saying? I don't know. I forgot. But I guess I need more, like, uh, Yupon Holly tea or something like that. <laughs> more caffeine. Yeah. Yeah. But, well, let's see. So, um, i got to teach someone online at about 11. I could, they could go late, start 11.05 or 11.10, but we'll go ahead. We've been going almost an hour we've been doing 50 minutes so um we can go ahead and wrap it up um for today and hopefully like talk again but so much more to talk about so much more we so much we covered though we'll let people digest this um oh yeah one thing i was going to say like with the grapes or some of this other stuff people you want community building like you're on nextdoor.com or whatever you want like neighbor night well people should grow some grapes and then you get together and you make jam and you got I was thinking wine, but sure, oh, jam yeah. is good too. <laughs> wine too, yeah. It's like They're well, the same level of difficulty, really. Oh, really? Huh. Yeah. Well, the thing with wine, it's a multi-day thing. You set it all up, and then you let it do stuff for like a week, and then you do something else to it, and let it sit for a week, and then you bottle it oh. up. So you have huh. a... And then yeah. if you if you got a number of people doing it, I mean, hey, it's like fun, no big deal. Yeah. Um, Older yeah. class. Yeah. Um, and then people could get stuff and make, uh, um, what did your grandfather call it? Um, cures what ails you. <laughs> yeah. Cures what ails you. Yep. The elderberry <laughs> stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With vodka. <laughs> yeah. Um, good stuff. Fond so, memories. Hazy memories, but fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. So a lot of stuff people could do with that. I mean, there's like. You know, we got the food, we got the medicinal stuff, a lot of stuff we haven't talked about. You'll learn more on his website, in his book, um, community stuff, getting outdoors, vitamin nature, vitamin movement, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but cool. So Vitamin uh, social. <laughs> yeah, truth. Any last words, Mark? No, no. But uh, foraging, especially if you're doing it right, leads to a, a more resilient you and a more resilient community. Yeah. Because it really does help if you get other people involved. If, yeah. For no other reason, just to spread the area you have to search out things. True. It's nice. Yeah. But cool. All right. Hopefully you enjoyed that, folks. Hopefully that's helpful. Um, give us some ideas of what you could do in your backyard. Um, improve your diet. Lower your water bill. Lower your bill buying vitamins as well as food. And, um, it's a, and plus, like when we get quote-unquote older, we're supposed to, like, it's good for us to learn new things. I mean, you know, instead of, like, doing a puzzle, you get out and do this. I mean, there's all kinds of new things you can learn, and it's, like, all kinds of avenues for other things. It's, like, it's amazing. And I know from experience. Yep. Um, for example, when I made my infamous cherry laurel tea. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you survived, and that's what's important. Thank goodness. Yeah, right.
But uh, if I can just add one thing along what you were saying. What? You can uh, see a big especially... S for stupid in my forehead? <laughs> uh, 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 totally different than that. Uh, <laughs> No, in Japan, so Japan has one of the most rapidly aging populations in the world. And so there's been a lot of study looking at how can you keep older people healthy. And one of the things they found is the more time they spend walking on uneven ground, mm. the healthier they become. Because it involves keeping the brain alert and, you know, and, and sensing the ground. The core muscles are strengthened. The sense of balance are strengthened. So True, it actually yeah. has just getting out and walking, off, you know, off the path over, you know, the, the the mud and the soil and the so forth. That serves you a lot of good, you know, health, you know, health benefits True. that yeah. last into you know old age. So and I know, yeah, I know that um, firsthand from my own experience. Um, I used to be uncoordinated and ungainly and like stupid walking even on a lawn that was a little uneven and through years of practice i mean now i you know go for runs on dirt trails in the woods where you got roots and it's very uneven and you go up and down and turn and it's made a you know big difference in my balance agility mobility strength so yeah i know like 100 percent firsthand that it works yeah mm -hmm. so it's important but cool so uh thanks and that's a topic I'll have to talk about sometime, um, moving out on the trails and how it's important to go barefoot and do that in our area. Or even if you don't want to go barefoot, get on the uneven trails. Yep. But cool. Definitely. Thanks. Thanks for bringing that up. But all right. I enjoyed it. Hope you enjoyed it folks. Uh -huh. and Always hope, a pleasure. Awesome. Hope we get to have more discussions like this. Cool. Anytime. Awesome. Okay. All right. Thanks. Take care. Okay.